Of course, nanotechnology isn't just about chemistry. It has important applications in, for example, the field of engineering. Construction cement, nothing to do with nanotechnology, you might think, but you'd be wrong. Phil, can you explain for us? Glad to, Leslie. When we mix the water with our concrete, uh, the cement within the concrete starts to undergo a hydration reaction. So if we imagine here we have some cement particles suspended in water, what happens is as these particles begin to react with the water, then all this outer layer is lost. And what happens is, as the reaction with the water continues, we start to form large amounts of something called CSH gel, which is a calcium silicate hydrate gel. And this grows outwards from the cement grains, begins to interlock like so, and that's what actually gives us the strength in our construction cement. If we zoom in on this area here and come down to this picture, this is what the structure would look like very, very close up. So here we have the layers of CSH gel. Think of it like a crumpled foil structure. In between the layers of foil, we have a level of porosity called the gel porosity. This operates at about 10 nanometers. And we have a level of porosity, this is the important stuff, the capillary porosity, which operates between 10 nanometers and one micron. And it's this nano porosity, this nanotechnology, which completely controls the behavior of cements. Well, this is great, Phil. How, how can we actually begin to use this in different fields to help people? Well, there are many other specialized uses for cements. Uh, we use it for encapsulating radioactive waste, for example, or for remediating contaminated brainfield sites so they can be built on again. But one area we're particularly exploring here is the use of a special sort of cements, calcium phosphate cements, for biomaterial applications. In particular, we're looking at them for use as bone cements. Now, bone cements, calcium phosphate bone cements, have been around quite some time. And so we're looking now at optimising the calcium phosphate materials and also looking at ways in which we can form uh, implants, medical implants, from these cements in new ways. And one of the ways we're very keen to look at is 3D printing, which might be something you've not come across before. Now, how does that work? Well, 3D printing is quite a clever process. It works almost exactly the same as inkjet printing that you might be familiar with except instead of printing onto paper, what we're doing is printing onto layers of powder. And after we've printed on one layer of powder, we then drop it down by a very carefully measured amount, we scoop another layer of powder over the top, and we then print another layer on top, and so on and so forth. And this allows us to slowly build up a 3D part made out of whatever powder we like to put in the machine. And is there any limit to the, the type of parts, the type of components that you can produce? Not really, no. Anything that you can put into a CAD model and that you can feed into the machine, you can print. It's as simple as that, really. So you can make new bones. I mean, what's this going to mean in terms of out outcomes for patients? Well, if we think forward and think about how the technology might be applied, what you might be able to do, for example, you've seen how they reconstruct people's faces from skulls that they've dug up, yes? Well, imagine going in the opposite direction. You have a face and you want to recreate the skull underneath so that you can, for example, repair someone's skull that's been damaged in an accident. You could take a photograph of them, you could reconstruct the 3D uh, shape of their face underneath, and then, for example, if they've damaged a cheekbone, you could print them a new cheekbone that was exactly the same as their old one, and then a surgeon could then re-implant that actually into their face. Now, I know you're very interested in looking outwards, not just confining the research to Warwick, um, and you're developing a network of people involved in this area. Could you tell me about that? Yes, we've recently received some funding to start building a network of scientists to work on these new and novel applications for cement. Uh, it's a global network. And what we're trying to do is attract people who've not worked on cement before. So there are many cement scientists in the country, but we're trying to bring to the table expertise from a wide, wide range of different disciplines. And nanotechnology, of course, is one of those disciplines, getting people who use nanotechnology in some of the other applications you might have seen in this video into bringing that expertise to bear on cement itself. And we're quite excited about that. Nanotechnology is at the cutting edge of science and sometimes it seems that the public and the media is worried about the fast pace of its development. GM technology suffered severe setbacks because of the public fears that surrounded it. So does the same fate await nanotechnology? When nanotechnology came to the fore you had the newspaper articles uh, Prince Charles, for example, grey goo, self-replicating robots. The public really got really concerned about what nanotechnology was going to do. They are scare stories and they pick up on points that, you know, the self-replicating robots is so far in the future. I mean, it's not probably ever going to ever happen. Nanotechnology has been around for many, many years. I mean, back to the times of Michael Faraday working with gold, 
nanoparticles. He was doing nanotechnology, it just didn't have the name attributed to it. So it's dispelling the myths, I think. That's what it's really important to be working with at the moment. Nanotechnology has been with us for many hundreds of years, almost, in the form of cements. Um, there are many chemicals and many things that we use every day that we might not think of as nanotechnology, which actually are nanotechnology. Suntan lotion, for example, has got titanium dioxide particles in there to protect you from the sun, so it's you know perfectly safe. And actually, there's some really, really nice example what we did, because we had an agricultural company, Syngenta, come to us and go like, well, you know, we have this plant food that has to be sprayed out on the field, and we have a problem because the plant food degradates in sunlight. So what can we do about this? And we were like, well, you know, we like to play with small stuff and make bigger objects out of this. Can we maybe wrap a droplet in suntan lotion or sunblock in this particular case? So can we have these tiny titanium dioxide particles around a droplet? And we could do that. And here you see an image of it. So here you see an image of about 30 micron capsules that get sprayed onto the fields. And each of these little dots is about 100 nanometer. And the titanium protects the inside. So that's a really nice example. And obviously, that's quite similar stuff that you put on your body as a sunblock. I think the, the future looks amazing. You know, it looks not very small, it looks massive, to be honest. And uh, you know, there's lots of beautiful examples. If you look at the picture over here, for instance, it's a butterfly wing, and it's really complex, and it's a beautiful structure. And we try to make structures that look quite similar for a number of applications. Sometimes we need a regular pattern. And one of these examples, for instance, is solar cells. So here at Warwick Uni, a team uh, with one of my colleagues, Tim Jones, works on solar cell applications. And for that, for example, they need structures like this. So look at this. We've got 200 nanometer spheres that perfectly pack in a regular pattern. And this goes automatic. And we can make square meters of this stuff. And we can regulate the layers, the number of layers over here. So here you see an example. And they're thicker. But they're beautiful. And they're like crystals. And the advantage of this material is that you can impregnate it with a different material for solar cell applications. So why is this important? Well, we have to work on a bulk scale. You know, I can't really go to a microscope and with a tiny, tiny little pin set, pick up one of these and put one there and put one there and then the other one there. This has to go like automatic. So that's one of the things that we're looking at and it's very, very exciting. Another issue here with what we've been dealing with is foams. We've been working on foams and this will come out like in summer and it's very exciting. We found a new way of making hybrid foams that you know, can have potential massive advantage in lab on a chip separations, maybe even for bone regrowth. So that's really, really cool, um, I think. And then here, uh, another thing is that people are interested in making different types of particles, adding complexity. Because we pretty much can make nice little spheres now, but can we make other shapes? And we're working on a way, for instance, to make peanuts. Now, why do you want to do that? Peanuts are quite interesting. If you look at peanuts and they pack, they pack different as spheres. And you can make different type of materials with that. And you can play with these. And, and people here are modeling how they behave, how they assemble, what can we do with them. And I think that's very, very exciting. We're very excited about continuing the collaboration between engineering, chemistry, and all the other departments that are doing work on nanotechnology. Who knows what that sort of thing could actually throw up. We're looking at things like microelectronics, for example looking at ways of miniaturizing the 3D printing so we could directly print things like sensors or transistors or even full-on working electronic parts. So who knows? I don't know. That's the beauty of nanotechnology. It could, it could take you anywhere. We're really excited actually about what the future of our research in nanotechnology offers. We've got a lot of equipment built up, we've got a lot of the initial experiments in place, we've got patents out to protect our ideas, and we've got companies now coming to us wanting to work with us to exploit some of the ideas. So they're not frightened by nanotechnology, they see all the prospects of it. So we've got companies such as Syngenta, we've got the Environmental Agency, working with companies like Element 6, the Diamond People, all wanting to work and see what nanotechnology can do for the good. Thank you.